we've hit a milestone up to this point where we're able to create accounts now. We'll do here Victor at victor.com, password Victor. We're able to create accounts and if I'm able if I create a brand new account and then I do log in here well okay let me log in with the account I just created I forgot that I put capital letters or not but it's not going to matter right because we've got that to uppercase or to lowercase then my password then I go whoops passwords match welcome Is that? Oh, I, I didn't have the latest. I didn't have the latest version of my code running. Um, let me do that again. I had Firefox open where I didn't have the latest version, so that was anticlimactic. Let me do that one more time. So, uh, create a brand new account. Create a brand new account. So um, yeah, big milestone here, being able to log in. Um, we forgot our log out. That's got to be set up eventually. But we've got the ability to create accounts. They're all being stored in our local storage, in our sort of cookie area. Um, what I want to do here is I don't if I have my uh, console closed or if I clear my console I don't have that history of feedback but what I want like I said at the bottom here I wanted to show the person's email who is currently logged in we are able to store and retrieve that information of course we are able to write JavaScript to alter existing HTML as I said JavaScript is very powerful it is used to write JavaScript, but it is used to also read and write HTML and CSS, and it's used to create or destroy HTML or CSS elements. So what I want to do is change it so that instead of saying this, I want it to show the person's email or make it say, welcome, Victor, or whatever their, their name is. I want to do that. So we have to deal with keeping track of who is currently logged in so that we know whose comics to show, which database of comics to show, <coughs> to keep track of then who has logged out, who has logged in, and to then alter the screen. So back to the code. Oh, uh, actually, one more quick little thing. Uh, when we do this stuff about logging in, logging out, and you get all of the stuff in the console here, I find it useful to once in a while clean the console by clicking the, the little clear console icon. It's different in Chrome and Firefox, but on both there should be a little icon to clean it out. I'll be doing that once in a while to, uh, to just uh, clean up whatever is there, because at a certain point it's too much stuff there. And you lose track of what feedback you're getting. So it seems to be Control-L also clears it. OK, back to the code. This is the to-do item that I had here. Show the user's email at the bottom of PG Home. Well, the way this is working, the way this is working is there's obviously some visual element here that I can latch onto to change. From a technical point of view, code-wise, what is this element down here called? Footer, footer yes. The uh, HTML code of footer. Let's go look at our index.html file to further give us information about that little area. So back to index.html. Let's go find the footer of PG Home. It's at approximately a line 111. Footer, data role, footer, data position fixed, and then the text down there. 
Well, what I want to do is uh, change what is visible down there. This text that is currently there, I can add to what's already there or completely change what is there. And we can do it a couple different ways. Let's just do it the easy way for the moment that we will replace what is visible here with the person's email or some other message. In order for us to then latch on to this, we've had other instances, for example, in the form to sign up to be able to, to read what is in this input field for their password, we latched onto the ID. We were able to read what was in there via the ID. And we were able to change what was there via the ID. Remember when we cleared out the input field in case they mistyped it. So if we have an ID or some other unique identifier on that area down there where the copyright notice is, we can latch onto it and change what is there. So if we add the attribute ID equals something, we have then a way to latch onto this H4 and manipulate it. <laughs> yes? Is FD preferred over, let's say, doing like a div and nesting anything in the div and then calling it to the div? I would think of those as two separate things. A div has a purpose, and an ID has a purpose. I wouldn't say one or the other for that. You could create nested divs, of course. Most likely, you would still put some sort of ID or class to them, because which ID are we talking about? This div inside of here, or this div over here? So most likely, you'll it's more specific. We're specifying this particular element. Technically, we've got an H4 inside of a footer. You could do also a div inside of a footer. The thing about IDs and classes are that they're used both in CSS and JavaScript. And um, they're both the right answer to use depending on what you're trying to do. Which actually um, brings me to this red herring. We're not going to use ID here, we're going to use class. Now, if you don't know, we'll make a little note here. ID can only be used once per document. Class can be used many times per document. ID would work just fine in this one instance, in this one footer. But what if I wanted my email address to appear in seven footers? I couldn't use ID for all seven of those footers. An ID should only be used one time with its unique name per document. Even though we've got different sections, it's all one document. So if I wanted down on my PG options, <coughs> to also have a footer with an ID of whatever, that wouldn't work. It would be wrong. One ID for one thing. One unique identifier for one thing. Class, on the other hand, can be used multiple times. I can attach this class to seven things, and it'll be happy. So we're going to use a class here, and we're going to call this user email. These things are going to be called whatever you want them. That's what I'm calling it at the moment. but. Wherever I want to display the user's email address, I attach this class to it. I add the class attribute to anything, anywhere, and my email will appear there once I finish programming it in JavaScript. The point is that I've got an anchor to latch on to. Anywhere where there's a class called this, put my email there. That's the one little thing we need to change here inside the HTML. Then we can go back to the JavaScript. Um, and we've only got one thing with this class, so it almost looks like a, an ID. But again, if I wanted this to happen on seven footers, I just add class user email to all seven footers, and all seven footers will change as we're about to do. Back to the JavaScript. Well, we've got an HTML element. We've got an HTML node 
that I want to manipulate via JavaScript, just like any other of these HTML nodes that I want to manipulate via JavaScript. Step one, make a JavaScript object of the HTML node. So let's go back to the top of our code where we've got all of our variables, all of our global variables. Line 34 or so. Note, special case, we are making a, uh, a JavaScript variable based on multiple HTML nodes or classes. So var dollar l user email equal to dollar selector quotes what's in the quotes <clears throat> at the very least user email dot pound means ID dot means class so special case, we are making a JavaScript variable based on multiple HTML nodes or classes. Another node if you'd like, dollar, uh, pound sign equals ID and dot equals class. Pound in JavaScript is equal to ID in HTML. And dot in JavaScript is equal to class in HTML. So now this object contains all instances of everything named with that class meaning we can change 10 things at once, or affect 10 things at once, where all of these were only affecting or dealing with one thing at a time, with one unique ID that existed in my 300 lines of HTML. So now we've got an object in JavaScript to do what we want with it. We'll go back to our function login. We'll go back to our function where we were logging in, and now we can reference all of those HTML nodes with that class. So back to the end. Um, I haven't mentioned this enough, and I'll mention it as we keep going on. Uh, if you're still using, you know, the mouse and all of that to navigate, you know, scrolling up and down, sure. But really, the keyboard has all of these buttons that will help you be a better programmer. If you're not used to using, for example, the home and the end buttons or the arrow keys on the keyboard definitely start using these things. For example, if I press home, the cursor goes to the beginning of the line. If I press end, it goes to the end of the line. Yes, you can move your mouse from here and drag it all the way across over here and press it here. Or you can press end and you're at the end. You can press home, you're at the beginning. Well, if you hold control, home, it'll take you to the very top of your document instead of scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and ruining your carpal tunnel muscles. If you want to go to the very end of the document, control end, you're at the end of the document, instead of scrolling and scrolling to get to the end. So I say that because a moment ago I was at I was near the beginning of my code. Now I want to get to the very end quickly, control end, I'm at the end. I still have to scroll a little, but I'm further at the end. 
Now, if only there was a way to jump up and down a page at a time via the keyboard. Oh, look at that, page up, page down. So on the keyboard, you've got page up and page down. So if you'd like, continue using the mouse, but it's going to be much more efficient once you use simply home and page up, page down, arrow keys. So when I see people still, I need to get to the end of this line. I'm going to move my mouse from here to here. You should be just pressing end or home. And that'll come with practice. What I want on line 136 or so is I want, once I've confirmed the password matches, let's move you to home. Well, before we switch us from one screen to the other, let's put the person's email on the screen and then switch us to that screen. Because remember, the code runs in order. So if I'm about to write down here, you know, change their email or put their email on screen, it's going to possibly change them to the screen first and then change their email, and that might look weird. So that's why I put the to do message a little higher, right? I put the to-do message up here, to-do, show the user's email at the bottom of the page home. So back up there, line 133 or so, it's no longer a to-do item, I've to-done it. I want to show the person's email address here. So we've got the L user email object. That's the JavaScript representation of every instance of a thing with that class. Dot HTML. Let's write some HTML into every instance of a tag with that class, user email. So if I were to write in quotes, hello, everywhere that there is that class, email user, will then suddenly say hello. I don't want that, of course. I want the person's email. The email is being stored currently in this function. Temp val in email login. So I want to say, wherever there is this class, let's write some HTML. And what we're writing is whatever their email currently is. I copied and pasted it. We are using that temporary variable storing the value of their email. Let's write to their email onto the screen. And that is storing their email, however, all in capital letters. They probably didn't type it in capital letters. If only there were a way to make this lowercase. <coughs> Two dot lowercase. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of it saved as exactly they typed it. That would be a little more effort, which we could do, but I'm not really going to do. I've converted their email address, all uppercase, stored it in my local storage. We could save it uh, completely exactly how they typed it, but I think the problem with that is if they don't remember how they typed it the first time, they're going to get locked out the second time. You could make two local storage objects, one with the original email address and one with the uppercase one. Now you've got two things to worry about, so, <coughs> so good luck. So here then I'm putting it back to all lowercase. Let's test it out. Save it and run it. Log in. And then when you get to PG Home, before you get to PG Home, it'll write your email at the footer. Then it'll take you to PG Home and your email will be down there telling you then very obviously who's logged in. <coughs> so go ahead and save it and run it and see how that works.
let me check my code. Log in as v at v dot com. Go. Here's my email. I'm going to log in with a different account. Question? Question, guys? No? I'm going to log in with another one here. Selena at cat. So then Selena at cat is what shows up at the bottom. So it should show you your email address once it takes you to PG Home. Okay, guys there, uh, <coughs> that row is a little noisy at the moment, I'm lecturing. So this is anywhere where this class exists, that email happens. Now, it is completely overriding what was originally there. What if I wanted to say still that copyright message and then the email? We have a way to do that too. We have some JavaScript code to instead add to what's already there. What's happening here with HTML, it replaces what's there. So just making a note here, HTML jQuery uh, method of uh, will replace everything already there. There's another one which I have to look up. I don't think it's that hard, but I have to look it up. There's another one that we could use to add to what's already there, either at the end or the beginning of what's already there. We'll look it up in a moment. This is the one I have here. This one replaces whatever's already there. Maybe sometimes we want that, maybe sometimes we don't. So maybe add a to-do item here. To do, look up the JavaScript or the jQuery uh, method to add to what's already there. We'll come back to it later. Okay, so uh, we've gotten to the point of logging in seems to work. Let's get log out to work. Um, I want to log out so that a different user can log in. Right now, I was just sort of testing it a bit by just pressing back on the web browser. We cannot rely on that. We have to rely with the navigation scheme of the app itself. In the app, I want to give the user the ability to log into the app, log out, not relying on a back button. Because even, even though on Android devices we have a back button, we don't have back on iOS, we don't have back on other devices. So within the app, I want to have the navigation fully set up. Um, so the way that's going to work is once I'm logged in, we're going to go to Options and we're going to click Log Out. Now this could be a completely simple HTML solution in that when a person clicks the log out button it just takes you to PG welcome. But it cannot be so simple because that's not keeping track of who is logged in to then switch you to another user. Plus if I were to click log out it would just log out. I would say I would want to say are you sure you want to log out? Don't we want some little bit of that user feedback just in case? I didn't really mean to log out. So that's going to be JavaScript. We need to use JavaScript to keep track of who's logged in to log them out. And we need to use JavaScript for it to make a decision or prompt us to confirm do we want to log out or not. Um, so first, just to refresh my memory, the log out button is probably a A button. We gave it an ID. Okay, good. BTN logout. So we did that a little while ago. 
Uh, the logout button is a href to nowhere. It's behaving like a button with an icon, and we did give it an ID early on. ETN logout. Okay, here's an HTML element that we need to use in JavaScript. So what does that mean? Say that again. We use the ID exactly how in JavaScript. The hashtag, yes. We're going to write a variable, and then based on the ID, hash, hash mark, we create an object of it. So let's go back to where all of our, remember, control home. We're going to go back to where all of our variables are at. We're going to make a variable based on the name of the ID of that button. This is going to be pretty much the same as these other ones we've worked with, because there's only one item with this unique ID. Create a variable. So we're creating an object. We're creating a JavaScript object of an HTML node. $L BTN logout. Right, that's what we called it over here, BTN logout. Yeah. So L BTN logout is equal to or assign it, that's what the equals is, assign it, the HTML node that we search for with its unique ID, pound sign or hash mark, btn logout, yes. So now we've got an object to work with representing that HTML button. When we had um, L form login, we did something similar. We, we made uh, a, a variable out of the whole form, and therefore when we clicked submit, something happened. This is not exactly the same in terms of, yes, I want to click and have something happen, just like I want to click submit and have something happen, but the one up here is working because of a form. We still need an event handler. Remember, on the event of submit, log us in. Here, on the, on the event of trying to log out, do stuff in a, in a function. So we'll go to the portion of our code where all of our event handlers are at, at the very end. Control end on the keyboard. Line 158. Here's our object. With the event listener, we handle it by running a function. Very similar to this. Now for that button. So after that, we have the object we just created LBTN log out. We're not submitting anything. Submit only is used waiting for a form to be submitted. Right here, we're waiting for a plain old button to be clicked. And it's called on. And I'll make the notes in a moment. On click. This is the more generic. On the event of a click, do something, run a function. This is basically if we had lform signup dot on quotes submit run a function. And here it is generically object dot on click run a function comma, fn logout. Now that also looks different. And again, I'll write it in the notes in a moment. That looks different too. We're missing function, we're missing event, we're missing the name of the function, parentheses event. This syntax is necessary for submit. This much simpler syntax 
is necessary for a plain old generic button. So, good, good reason to use a note here. Something dot submit syntax only for a form. Something else dot on click syntax for a generic button. Usually we'll be using this one. Click this button, click that button. Obviously we started off with some uh, with some forms to create an account or to log in, but we we will often be doing that on click instead to log out, to delete the database, to change a record in the database. We're going to use both. And the syntax is different, but at least if you've written the syntax properly at least once, you can reuse it later. So on the event of a click of that button, run this function, fn logout. That means we need to now back up a little bit and define fn logout. So after the end of our function login, we're going to create a function logout. Line 150, fn log out, parentheses, curly braces, make yourself a little note, that's the end of function log out. Right now it's really small, so uh, you obviously won't lose track of it, but as you start to add 1 or 2 or 12 or 100 lines, you're going to lose track of that curly brace. This one does not need um, what we use for the other functions of this prevent default. There's no default behavior for a generic button, so we won't need to do that. That was the whole point of having this really long syntax. There is an event, there is a default event of refreshing the screen. We need to capture it so that we could do event dot prevent default. There's no such thing here. There's no default behavior, so we don't need it. But what do we do need, as we often have been doing at the beginning of our function? As soon as the function we write here, what have you been doing? Console log. We want to give ourselves some console log to have at least the minimum feedback that this is running as we expect, because it's happened so many times that someone is very sure of their code, and they're clicking and clicking and clicking, and nothing happens. Well, if they had only put in some console output, we would have seen at least that this on click is not working because they wrote on clack instead of on click. So function log out is running. It would be overkill, and I don't do this, but I see some people do it. At the end of your functions, you could also write some console log output. Don't do this. But you could also be writing console log output at the end of your function that says function whatever is done running. That's another further layer. fn log in finished. Don't do this if you want to do this. But So now we, I've got a little marker here that that function started running. This function ended running. We could have been doing that this far. I think it's a little too much overkill, but you could be doing that as well. Okay, so log out. Log out is, is not that complicated. We'll do a little bit more than we'll wrap. Um, the idea with function log out is. Um, want to say conditional statement 
to confirm that a person really wants to log out. Okay, conditional statement. Well, we've, we know a few of those, if else. I'm going to show another kind of conditional statement. There's, we could do it with if else. I just want to show another kind of one because, as I said, in the purpose, one of the purposes of the class is I'm giving you a lot of pieces of the puzzle. And then you can take those pieces and make your own thing out of it. So sometimes this other kind of conditional statement might be more useful to you than the if else. We're going to use then a switch statement checks a number of known possibilities to determine the correct one. Then executes code or runs code based on it and should include an if all else fails default possibility. Uh, so we have the option here. It's gonna we're gonna have it say, are you sure you want to log out? We have, yes, I want to log out, or no, I made a mistake, or I don't want to log out, but I want to switch accounts, or I don't want to log out, but I want to delete my database. So we have different possibilities, one, two, three, a thousand possibilities. If else, as we've used it so far, has two possibilities, true or false, user exists or not. But a switch statement uh, could be set up with multiple possibilities. And then, like one, fi one final, I don't know what you want, possibility, a default possibility. The skeleton for a uh, switch statement uh, looks like this. You write switch, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. And switch for confirming log out. So basically, uh, when we had if, parentheses, else, asking us sort of a question, if, and if it's true, do the stuff here, or else it's false, do the stuff there. Switch. We'll ask a question here, and we have possibilities. In this case, do that. In this case, do this. In this case, do that. So the further syntax is, we then have case A colon A code break. You can have a case of a possibility of B colon B code one or one thousand lines break and you can have as many of these case C case D whatever uh, then we have the default case like okay uh, I don't know what you want here's the third possibility I'm gonna ask a question the result could be this so do this code stop skip the rest you could ask it a question, they give the result this. So do this stuff here, stop, don't do the rest of the code. It wasn't this, it wasn't this. Well, okay, let's then skip all of this, jump to this, and the switch and continue the code. In this case, really, we just have, um, do you want to log out, yes or no? But again, I'm giving you these different possibilities because perhaps in your version of the app you want three choices or six choices. So each choice will be its own case. But what we're going to ask over here in Switch is we have the 
JavaScript method confirm. Now we, we have, just to remind me, we have done alert, right? Uh, I think we have. Uh, what, what, what did alert do? <clears throat> just a simple pop-up. OK. That's built into JavaScript. It's just kind of plain. It doesn't have much interactivity. Via jQuery Mobile, we can uh, create a better pop-up box. We have a built-in confirm JavaScript, plain old JavaScript confirm pop-up box that will ask whatever you want it to ask, and it'll say yes or no. Whereas the alert just said OK. When that popped up, it had one thing, just OK. Confirm uh, can have a couple of possibilities. The message of the confirm box will be in quotes. Let's see, are you sure you want to log out? So we'll get a kind of a pop-up with that message. Are you sure you want to log out? It'll have then the options. Uh, uh, yes or cancel. It depends on the browser also what those buttons will say. So we're doing this basic JavaScript code, but later we'll do a, some better uh, uh, jQuery mobile or Cordova code. But we'll get that pop-up. And basically uh, what the pop-up uh, result will be will either be true or it'll be false. And well, if we're in true, then in the console here, we'll say they did want to log out. The false, they didn't want to log out. And there, in this case, there really shouldn't be like a third possibility, but it's a good idea to put a default possibility. That's the if all else fails possibility. Think about it in terms of, let's say we're, we're making a video game, and the switch is set up that if you've gotten points from 1 to 10, you get a message saying you're a beginner. If you get points between 11 and 20, then the next case would say you're intermediate. If you then get points between 20 and 30, you get a case of, you know, you're advanced. Um, if I get somehow negative points, I didn't think of negative points, so default will, kill, will kick in, because I didn't define it up here. So for this console, I could say, Unknown response. People always ask that, and I've seen documentation on both about adding the break or not, because it is the last line of the switch, so technically, obviously, you're at the end, so it's done. But I've seen documentation on both that say yes or no to use it. I, I personally like to use it because of the consistency of I know that this is a chunk, break, this is a chunk, break, this is a chunk. You could leave it out to save a few bytes of data and, and RAM, but I like to leave it in. We can also double check like over at the Mozilla documentation, and that's the one I would trust the most, and see if they have it, what they say. Um, let's test it here. Save it and run it. Log into the account. Go up to the little options button. Click the log out button. You should see a pop up, the confirm box. Try to click OK. It won't log you out yet. We're not there yet. But you'll see console output that says you did want to log out. Instead, cancel the log out. And um, get that output. I don't think you'll be able to trigger the unknown response because of the particular nature of our confirm. There shouldn't be a third option. But if you get it to work, let me know. I want to see what you broke. Check my code. Now, 
I was logged in previously and yes we will set it up so that it remembers that you logged in we're not there yet so yes you will have to log in again but we will fix that to have it remember you I'm logged in I see my email down there good that still works no errors yet go up to the options there's my button click it there's my pop-up this page says are you sure you want to log out now Firefox might show it differently Chrome shows it differently whatever we have more control of that when we uh, use uh, jQuery mobile we'll get to that if I cancel I hit false line 163 it didn't want to log out if I try to log out again click OK this time they did want to log out I hit true if I click outside of it nothing happens here other browsers I think they also have a little X you hit that one maybe you get the third one thing here okay I'm getting this feedback seems to be going how I expect well nothing really needs to happen under default it's for troubleshooting it if they cancel it okay great they're back in the app what actually happens is under true and this is then when it will move me from the current section back to another section so a new line after the console We're going to use that syntax that I showed a little while ago about moving from screen to screen. I remember this when we moved from when we moved from um, login screen to PG PG home. Same same thing. Selecting the current screen, page container, we will change to PG Welcome with then options. We're going to change the current page container. The current page container, we're going to change quotes pound PG Welcome. That's the very first screen of the app, PG Welcome. That's where they log in or sign up is at, right? PG Welcome. Then outside the quote, comma, curly braces, the uh, transition option. We've been doing flip all along, but I think I want to do slide down. I want to change the animation because again we have six to choose from and we can program our own we've been using the same one flip over and over which has been subconsciously put into the users mind so far about when I when a flip happens I'm just moving normally I'm going from here to here this is something now kind of different I've logged out of the app so I want a different type of animation to catch their attention that they've done something different rather than the normal navigation so with slide down, the current screen that they're at will slide down out of the way and take them to PG Welcome. And lastly, that form to log in still remembers who was the last person to sign in. Well, the point of someone logging out is most likely they want to log in as someone else. They can, of course, delete what's already in that form, and the other person can log in as they want. They can press the button, clear the form. Why not make it easier for them? Not only log them out, but also clear the last person that logged in. So there's the form. This is just the way it has to be within array syntax. Don't worry about it. Dot reset reset that form whatever they were trying to log in as so we're saying 
So move us from the current screen back to PG welcome section for a new user and clear the login form for the next user. So uh, I'll check my code here. I'm going to log in. I'm going to try to log out, and let's see if this works. It's going to ask me. I will confirm if all of that works. Then it should change me to the other screen, and then I can log in as someone else. I'm going to log in as V. There I am logged in. Go up to the options, click log out, get the pop-up. Uh, maybe I don't want to log out. Okay, cancel. That works as it did a moment ago. Actually, do want to log out. Click log out, click OK. This thing slide out of the way. I'm back to choose to sign up or to log in. When I go to log in, that should be empty. It should not have remembered that I was as, as V user. Log in as Selena. Go on that. Logged in as Selena down there. Go back up to here, log out, confirm, back to login again. So I would say at this point our login, logout system is like 90% finished. We still have a little bit more to do that we'll do next time. I'll put my version of the code into the network folder in just a moment here, but general questions on what we did so far. We introduce this new concept of switch, which is another kind of conditional statement. It'll come up again a little bit later. And we use if else a little bit more, and we change from screen to screen based on uh, the the code rather than the user interaction. 